Growing up as a child, I feel I was born in a weird in-between point of console generations. The PlayStation 1 released when I was three years old, in Europe at least, and I received one for my seventh birthday. Before that point, I relied on two things for my entertainment. Annoying the living daylights out of my family, and a few older generations of consoles that came out only a small handful of years beforehand. For my older brother's fifth or sixth birthday, Sorry brother, I can't remember which. He brought home a Super Nintendo Entertainment System, or SNES, which at the time I had no clue how large an impact it would have on my life. Sometime around then, I loosely remember waking up and going downstairs in the middle of the night when I was having trouble sleeping, to find my mother playing through Pitfall, the Mayan Adventure. This is my earliest memory of the game, and today I will take you on a retrospective journey to learn about the series it belongs to pitfall, as well as my opinions on the series leading up to the current state of the franchise as it is today. Welcome to the Recline of Gaming. A warning, the following footage may contain spoilers for the Pitfall series of games. You have been warned. In 1977, the Atari 2600 was released an important milestone in gaming, as the console is credited for having popularised ROM cartridges, a format that is still used in video game consoles today. Atari had licensed many famous and well-remembered games that people, well, still remember. Pac-Man was ported to the console, having been the most sold game on the platform, as well as games like Asteroids, Missile Command, Frogger, and some other games. Along came 1979, a company called Activision was formed, the first ever independent third-party console video game developer, founded by former Atari game developers, upset at how they were treated whilst working for Atari directly. They at the time were responsible for the creation of such imaginatively named video games as boxing, skiing, ice hockey, tennis, and chopper command. Activision founding father and beardy bloke David Crane piped up, stating he had developed the technology to display a realistic running man, and in April 1982, Pitfall was released. I have to give him some credit. After some of those other originally named titles, Pitfall is quite a well-named title. I still wonder how they came up with that one, though. Right, so we have this guy, he runs and jumps and occasionally he falls into pits. Great, I have a name for it already. Go on then, how about Pitfall? Give that man a raise! Pitfall was incredibly successful for the 2600 and was the number one video game on the Billboard charts for 64 weeks in a row. Several ports were made for other gaming computer systems, such as the MSX, Commodore 64, Atari 800, and TRS-80 color computer, as well as for some home consoles, such as ColecoVision and Intellivision. I wouldn't be surprised if some of its fame was caused by the success of Raiders of a Lost Ark, having come out in 1981. Explorer-type characters must have been all of the rage at the time. The game sold roughly 4 million copies, which had solidified its place as second most sold game on the platform, falling only behind Pac-Man. If not for Pitfall, there's a possibility that comedian, musician, and actor Jack Black may not have been as well known as he is today. Just last night, I was lost in the jungle with Pitfall Harry, surrounded by giant scorpions and man-eating crocodiles. So what about the game itself? Is it any good? Well, as far as super old video games go, I'd say yes. Compared to a lot of other games at the time, there was quite a bit of variety. The game is laid out in screens. You can run to screens on your left or to your right, as well as explore an upper and lower level 
that contain different obstacles, the lower usually containing scorpions, the upper containing a larger variety of challenges such as pits of quicksand which open and close, snakes, open fires, what I assume are alligators and not crocodiles, rope swings, the ever so deadly barrel, and the most difficult obstacle of all, 1980s sound design in video games. I love this swinging noise, it's incredible, some proper George of a Jungle crap right there. Some pros and cons. Pros, the game is smooth, animation is crisp, gameplay is responsive, platforming is precise and tight. Plus look at that realistic running man, Mr. Crane, you're on to something big. Cons, some of the obstacle placement is questionable, and that makes you lose points and lives almost as soon as you're onto the next screen. If I run out of lives, I have to reset the game whilst the Activision logo mocks me in the bottom corner. For shame, Activision, you dare advertise yourself to me upon my untimely demise? Grabbing ropes sometimes doesn't feel right either, like am I supposed to jump at the vines or with the vines? Come on! Some other noted points. Standing on barrels makes you gassy. Dying anywhere puts you on the left hand side of a screen even if you are approaching from the right. Don't want to bother with an obstacle? Sacrifice yourself for a quick warp to the left. Grabbing treasure feels satisfying. Please reward noise, give me more endorphins. Overall, I'd rate the game a strong 4 recliners out of 10. It's nothing too amazingly fun, I've never managed to finish the game, though I could with time. It just seems to take a lot more patience with repetitive scenarios more than anything else. For the time, I'd say it was a great game, but a lot of stuff loses its charm over the years, and games that came out a few years later on the NES completely trounced this, fun-wise. Something I always thought was cool was if people could beat a score of 20,000 and got a photograph of your television, you'd be sent a fabric patch that could be heat applied or sewn onto clothing of your choice, along with a letter from Activision signed by Pitfall Harry himself. You could sew it onto your backpack, your t-shirt, your punk jacket filled with band patches, your cursed book of human leather, you name it. Although as pleasant as that was things wouldn't last so pleasantly for much longer. A year after the release of Pitfall, the video game world, whilst still young, sunk into darkness. Due to market saturation, people caring less about games consoles and more about home computers, uncertainty was boosted amongst the North American games industry, leading to a two year long crash that cost the industry a lot. It was effectively responsible for ending the second generation of video game home consoles. Several home computer and video games companies became bankrupt, with only a handful of giants surviving the fallout. Atari only just made it really, their popularity didn't maintain for much longer. Nintendo however was solely responsible for the crash reversing. Enough of that depressing stuff though, let's go on to Pitfall 2, Electric Boogaloo- I mean Pitfall 2, The Lost Caverns. The game was released in 1984, ported to several kinds of home computer, and was praised for its technical impressiveness, boasting a chip within the cartridge known as the Display Processor Chip. I know, yet another imaginative Activision name right here. Regardless, it existed to improve the game's visuals, and provided two more layers of audio, which were utilised well in this game. So the good thing about sequels is they either take what exists and improves upon it, or sometimes they forget about the soul of a game and change a little too much. Fortunately, this is a positive example of the former rather than the latter. Where the first Pitfall was very simple, they added a few more layers to Pitfall 2 The Lost Caverns. Literally, instead of just two layers, there were like 27 of them. They added a soundtrack, a soundtrack which seems to dynamically restart whenever you mess up and change slightly to reward you for doing well. Overall, the game was less linear, there's a bit of backtracking, a bit more going back and forth to find everything, making this, I am fairly certain, one of the first 
open world games. And with the slight genre hop came a few minor quality of life improvements. There are more enemy sprites, birds, rats, bats, frogs, the scorpions make a reprisal, there's electric eels, and there's a vibrating cheetah man. The golden bars look super flashy. Is that sparkles or an arrow? The gold is right here! There's a thing where a balloon makes you Mary Poppins off into the cave. You can now swim, suspending yourself above the ground in water. I thought this game was made by David Crane, not David Blaine. Right, moving on, there are these little plus signs scattered around the caves which serve as checkpoints, which aren't as generous as a respawn mechanism in the last game, but you do not need to worry about running out of lives this time around. You just lose points in lieu of those lives. However, where there's more to do, there can be more issues. You've got to be careful when performing jumps or climbing ladders, else you may fall infinitely into the drink. And if I've learned anything about reaching terminal velocity, Pitfall Harry needs to make sure that his cheeks are clenched when he goes legs first into the water. Jokes aside, climbing back up out of the water again feels frustrating. A lot of things enemies can go through, you can't. We're dealing with ghost animals here, apparently. Some of the treasures are kind of not clearly things you should be collecting. How was I supposed to know that the previously mentioned vibrating cheetah man, which is not an enemy, was supposed to be a piece of treasure? Didn't you get the clue? The vibrating cheetah man is clearly supposed to be treasure. You can tell because he's golden. Once again, jokes aside, turns out Vibro Cat is Pitfall Harry's pet mountain lion, Quicklaw. He's shaking because he's cowardly. If you're so frightened, man, why go into the cave? Another character you find and rescue in the caverns is Harry's adrenaline junkie niece, Rhonda. Both characters were invented for an animated tie-in for the original Pitfall. I shan't get into too much detail on that. Yet. Overall, I'd say the game's a lot more fun, with a bit more of a variety of stuff to do. It certainly improved over the previous game in my opinion, but as the game came out a bit later in the Atari lifecycle, it only managed to be the 15th most sold Atari 2600 game, paling in comparison to the second place earned by the first game. Although it was received incredibly well during the dawn of the video game crash of the 80s taking place, it's no surprise that Atari games weren't selling as much. In spite of that, however, the crash didn't stop the game from becoming the most successful arcade machine sold in Japan in 1985. For later, in the late noughties, issue 46 of Retro Gamer magazine named it number one out of 25 in best Atari 2600 games of all time. I'd rate the game 5 recliners out of 10. A clear improvement over the first, but still nothing to stand out enough to make me want to play it during my spare time. Before continuing on to the next generation of games, I feel it's necessary to take a bit of a detour to discuss Saturday Supercade. What's Saturday Supercade? I hear you ask. Or not. I wouldn't be surprised if you weren't asking. Well, Saturday Supercade was a series of short animated episodes cashing in on the success of the golden age of arcade gaming. Essentially, it was the equivalent of Saturday morning cartoons, only instead of trying to sell kids toys, it was trying to shake their parents' wallets free of pennies and quarters to be spent in the arcades. Saturday Supercade featured such popular characters at the time as Frogger, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., Qbert. Do I pronounce it Qbert, or do I pronounce it Q asterisk Bert? What does the asterisk mean? Space Ace? Kangaroo? What on earth is Kangaroo? I've never heard of Kangaroo before. Oh, that's Kangaroo. Okay, cool. Oh, and Pitfall Harry had his own animation as well. Pitfall had seven featured episodes, running from September 1983 to December 1983. It's really hard to find clips of this cartoon online, and where it can be found, the footage is all warbly and the audio is rather gnarly sounding. Regardless, let's go over some of it, shall we? The first episode I could find was an episode called Raiders of the Lost Shark. Already, references to Indiana Jones. I knew they wouldn't be avoidable. The episode seemed to be narrated by Rhonda, Pitfall Harry's niece that I'd mentioned before. It's highly likely that she was made the narrator as a relatable character for children, someone they could project themselves onto. If I can say anything as cool, they occasionally do the da -da 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 from the fanfare-like noise in Pitfall 2, a pleasant carryover from the game. Something I don't like is that everyone calls Harry Uncle Pitfall, which weirds me out. Is Pitfall his name? I thought it was like a nickname, if anything, but the fact literally everyone calls him Pitfall 
But if Harry is mentioned, you bet Pitfall comes before it every time. We're on our way. Where's Quickclaw? Raring to go, Uncle Pitfall! Harry seems to be the headstrong, generic, heroic protagonist type. Big shoulders, clean shaven face, the ability to swing from ropes flawlessly, you know, that thing he does in the game. They really milk it quite a bit. During several of the clips I found, he ad libs some kind of plot armor ass pulls, like turning a snake that he's found into a joystick by stroking it. This cartoon is a bit suggestive in places. Quicklaw, the third character, for example, is the generic talking animal coward character, halfway between Scooby Doo and Snagglepuss, as they seem to have made him not only a coward, but what I feel to be a character who has been coded to seem gay. Now I say coded because it doesn't seem to be an authentic representation, but a way that animation companies can pass someone else's identity off as being comedic or entertaining. You know, because back then it was allegedly alright to make fun of people for being different. Quicklaw, at one point, straight up makes suggestive noises when talking about preparing a sausage. <laughs> Let's see what goodies are in this picnic basket. Put my sausage on the bun. Oh yeah. Chop it off with a little mustard. Yeah. <laughs> this in itself leads to a situation where he gets into a fight with the snake and almost causes the plane to crash. You know, that bit that I just showed you a moment ago with the snake stroking. I quite like this bit where Harry uses his oxygen tank to propel himself through the water, though I'm not sure that it would quite work like that in real life. Synchronized shark swimming. Bring the treasure in. <laughs> Breaking the laws of physics is starting to get a bit too much. Not only is he walking on the floor of the ocean, raising a shark over his head, but three crocodiles, which are reptiles, are at the bottom of the ocean, breathing without any issues. Them being here makes no sense. Sorry, I've got to run. But he'll keep you company. <laughs> The other shark, which earlier was the same size as the first shark, is apparently now four times its size, as where the first was small enough to be lifted and held above Harry's head, this other one is massive. Once again, Harry defies the laws of physics as he throws an entire anchor really far away at a high speed underwater. Good what a mad lad. The villain of this episode, the shark, yeah I imagine that isn't confusing, seems to think himself some kind of marketing genius. on the black market. <laughs> These coins will fetch a nice price on the black market? Is he nuts? This currency will acquire us some nice currency, don't you think? What do you reckon he's going to buy with it? Money? I'm convinced Harry is just having us on for a laugh. He's straight up strong enough to keep an entire tree suspended in the air with a rubber band. All set, Rhonda. Apparently, this log is strong enough to penetrate the hull of a submarine. You know, something made to exist in the deep vacuum of the ocean. The shark doesn't even try to run away. He just sits in his submarine. Was one episode enough to critique it? Not quite. I won't be quite as thorough with the other clips I've found, but there's a few things worth mentioning. When I first saw the desert wasteland, my first thoughts were, oh, this is clearly India in quote marks. 
Once again, I'm not talking like a realistic depiction of India, I'm talking like a, you know, almost Agrabah-like comparison from Disney's Aladdin. It's not quite accurate, is it? Let's go. How do the gang get out of this one? Vote now. A. They cut themselves free from the webs. B. They burn or melt the webs away with something else. Or C. They wriggle along the floor like a worm, even though the webbing should be keeping them in place. Right, Rhonda. And I think the best way is to act like inchworms. Follow me. Scatter. It will be harder to catch three moving targets. Well, if you voted C, you'd be correct. Because of the sound quality, it can often be easy to mishear things that aren't necessarily there. Along with the, you know, accidentally dirty jokes that they put in, you can see how you can perhaps get a few things wrong. Quick claw, we gotta find some way to help them all quick claw! No. Excuse me? What did you just say? Well, this is no time to knit socks! No. Knit what? Knit socks! No. Knit what? Socks! After some reflection and a few hours thinking, I've learned that he was saying socks and not something ruder. Right, moving on. Overall, I rate this show 5 recliners out of 10. Whilst it's a horrid mess, and it's nonsense at times, I got such a good laugh out of how stupid it all is that I somewhat enjoyed it. I don't, however, agree with how certain characters are portrayed, and that does take off quite a few marks. Warner Archive said back in 2010 that they intend to release the episodes of Saturday Super K to DVD. Some characters' rights have reverted back to their original owner. No surprise there, it had been 27 years at the time, and thus would not be featured in their DVD release. Since then, there have been releases of Qbert's episodes, 17 of the 19 episodes on a two-disc DVD. However, there's been no news since that other segments will be released to DVD anytime soon. Next out was Super Pitfall, for the Nintendo Famicom, well known to the Western world as the Nintendo Entertainment System, NES, or NES. No longer were Atari part of Activision's radar, and they were moving on to bigger, better consoles. Though things weren't quite right here, series creator David Crane's name was oddly absent from the credits, nowhere to be seen, and the poor reviews were flowing in. Although the game was a sequel, it didn't mean that Activision were going to strike gold a third time. Whilst Pitfall 2 was a step in the right direction, there were a few things that Super Pitfall got wrong, and this was very much not good. Especially since this game was supposed to be a vague reimagining of the story of the Lost Caverns, but on a newer platform with better hardware. Let's get started then, shall we? My first criticism, yes, I'm getting right into the criticisms, after all, I don't think I have anything nice to say about this game, is that Pitfall Harry just looks like Mario in an explorer's outfit. This is lazy. I understand he's the Nintendo mascot, I understand it might be trendy now, but this is very unnecessary. My second criticism is that the animation quality has dropped in general. The realistic running man of the original games? Gone! The hitboxes in this game are trash, and it's easy to touch the wrong thing by accident as well. Some of the enemy and obstacle placement in this game is poor. There's a pit that you can fall in <laughs> right at the start, and you know what's there? Instant death spikes would be the correct answer. This game took Pitfall a bit too seriously. Absolute geniuses. With the return of Unlimited Lives, this somewhat sucked. A shared criticism of the game is that the game is incredibly frustrating to play, and Vegas all hell. Games website Gama Sutra went on to say that it's a pure trial and error expedition of the underground. To complete the game, you had to find and remember several secrets, many of which were found by jumping in random spots illogically, where you'd be warped to other sections of the map. I personally gave up playing this game very quickly. It was straight up disgusting to play, and I don't want to expose myself to further repeated torture. Was I a bit too harsh? No, this game is rubbish. I'll rate this one 0.5 recliners out of 10. Be gone. Enough. 
besides, anyone who's spent their fair share of time watching video game essays on YouTube already know that Super Pitfall is a bad game, and I probably don't need to go into this all that much, as my opinions will simply echo those that you may have already heard. Finally today, let's move on to the last game to be mentioned in my video. Let's play something a bit more pleasant in the direction of the game that introduced me to the series to begin with. Here it was, Pitfall the Mayan Adventure, also known as Pitfall Mayan no Daiboken in Japan, on the Super Famicom, once again in the West known as the Super Nintendo Entertainment System or SNES, was finally released. It was also on the Sega Mega Drive, that's Genesis to you Americans, Sega CD, Sega 32X, Microsoft Windows, Atari Jaguar, guess Activision hadn't given up on the Atari brand yet, and eventually was ported to the Game Boy Advance. What a game! What. A. Game. I might be slightly biased here, but I suppose that's why this is my retrospective review, and not yours. Pitfall the Mind Adventure is a forgotten gem, as far as I'm concerned. Every person I've mentioned this game to most likely knows of the original Pitfall, or has no clue at all, and that's why I'm here today. Time to educate you all on something brilliant. Hopefully by the end of this, you'll all be out there trying to find a cartridge of the game to enjoy for yourselves. The Mayan Adventure came out in 1994, eight years after the release of Super Pitfall, and this gave a lot of time to fix and change what had went wrong. The game had evolved into something more structured, there was more of a visible plot in the form of an opening cutscene. You're Harry Jr., son of Pitfall Harry, your dad has gone missing, kidnapped by an ancient spirit deep within the temples, hidden far into a jungle past raging rapids, mysterious mines and sunset-lit architecture filled to the brim with a myriad of wild animals out to genuinely kill Harry Jr. Does anyone else think that Harry Jr. bears passing resemblance to Bruce Campbell? Just me? Hmm. Maybe more on Bruce Campbell in video 2. A game that some people compared to similar platforming adventure titles of the time such as Aladdin, Earthworm Jim, or The Lion King, the animation was back to being top of the class. The way Junior moves, how he runs, jumps, climbs, swoosh down the vine, George, George, George of the jungle, strong as he can be. Watch out for that tree. I mean, look at how this thing shoots needles. He has a lot of personality too. Leave him alone and he starts to meditate. Swing his sling around like a nunchuck. It's pretty energetic. The soundtrack for the Mayan Adventure absolutely slaps. I mean, the sounds don't make a lot of sense at first, but then you realise it takes the concept from the Lost Caverns of the music updating as the stage progresses, and it becomes more like an evolution of the music. The songs grow more layered and complex the closer you get to the end of a stage, and I love it. What's great too is each version of the game has slightly different composition to make up for how the sound chip it was featured on sounded like. This resulted in some similar, but coolly different sounding tracks being produced. The sound effects are pretty cool as well, the noise that enemies make when they're defeated, the bursting noise of the glowy blue rocks, the boomerang sounds, the little cute snuffles of the spiny backed piggies, and the weird boing noise the stretchy thing makes when you cling onto it. It's all full of such life and it makes the game a joy to play. A lot of the details in environments and stages are beautiful as well. It looks like a lot of effort has gone into enemy design and level design here, so that the dark tone maintains alongside that adventurous peril we all wished for in our mid-90s platformers. In terms of the mechanics, you have a few ways to move about and attack. Running and jumping is fairly standard, and there's a variety of obstacles and platforms to work off of. Those trees you can launch off, vines and ropes to swing and climb, crocodiles to use as stepping stones, etc. There's four methods of attack. You can whip people with your sling, which is a bit odd, I admit, but the animation annoys are satisfying. You can shoot a pellet or rock from your sling as well. This will come in handy for boss fights and enemies that you don't want to get too
too close to. There are boomerangs. Admittedly, I barely use this one, so I'm not sure what it's particularly useful for. And finally, there are these awesome kill all things rocks, which I like storing up and spamming the bosses with. There are five types of level in the original version of the mine adventure, and each repeats once, plus a final boss stage, meaning that overall there's 11 stages. These go jungle, waterfall, mines, lost city, ancient temple, jungle, waterfall, mines, lost city, ancient temple, or at least that's what I like to call them. The further into the game you go, the weirder and more dangerous the enemies get, almost as if the Mayan jungle is coming to life to keep you further from successfully adventuring. There's a lot of learning to the difficulty curve of the game. It's easy to pick up, and you learn what does what quickly. Timing-based platforms are consistent, certain enemies and obstacles have easily readable patterns, checkpoints will often point in the direction of where you should be going next so you don't accidentally go the wrong way in some of the more open-looking areas. The game does have its moments where the difficulty curve will increase, but this feels very natural at all times. A lot of platforming failures can lead to instant death, especially where large rolling wheels or tar pits are concerned. Other enemies and obstacles will cause you to take a little damage. One of my favourite details about the game is extra lives are represented by a full body icon of Harry Jr, and the health bar in the top right corner is represented by one of these icons, running away from a crocodile. The more damage you take, the closer the crocodile gets to Junior. Healing by grabbing creepy realistic hearts will move the crocodile further away. Take enough damage and snap! The crocodile's jaws will clamp down on Junior, and you'll return to the last checkpoint idle. Something to note is there are a few minigames hidden in the game too. In the small few levels, there are rhythm-based lever-pulling Simon Says style games that can earn you extra points or even a life if you manage to make it to the end. I used to remember which lever to pull by imitating the noises they made whilst they displayed the pattern you had to remember. At the beginning of the fourth stage, the first Lost City style stage, you may notice a bizarre 8-bit scorpion chilling on a ledge. If you can and craftily platform your way to that ledge and enter the door, you can enter this portal and voila! The entire original pitfall hidden in the game. What a neat easter egg! One level I'm not sure if I love or hate is this one. It's an automated side-scroller which has you avoid weird demons whilst hopping up and down between three separate railway lines on this moving cart. Harry Jr. must have some hench calves to be able to kick that thing up the way he does. Dying on this level can be a bit weird, since you have to start all the way at the beginning, but the stage does give you plenty of hints that an obstacle is coming up, with audio cues such as the weird grunts demons make and visual ones such as red lights that show on the left hand side of the screen. The game isn't without its issues of course, so let's discuss a couple of these. A lot of the boss fights are rehashed. You fight four large wild cats in the jungle. I'm sure one of them transforms, but the second and third cats are fought at the same time and are kind of annoying to deal with. A few leaps of faith are required in order to optimise certain parts, and there are some areas of the game where it feels like you have to either take a hit or use one of your rarer consumable weapons to avoid it. Some of the visuals, depending on which version of the game you're playing, are trippy and it can make it hard to concentrate, such as the waterfall on the second level of the game. A few obstacles can throw you off and don't allow for a lot of reaction time. For example, the slippery rocks on the very same levels that don't seem to be featured elsewhere in the game. Or in some cases you have to change the camera angle by holding down for long enough just so you can see where you need to land after jumping off an oddly positioned platform. It can be easy to get overwhelmed or feel lost when getting used to the game still. Some things in the game punish you, such as certain containers exploding or releasing enemies where there would normally be a reward. Otherwise, I can't think of many negative things to say about the game, apart from the fact that it's too short. That's another negative. The game could be longer. Some versions of a game had an extra level or something, which I would have loved to have played on the SNES, but I think, you know, the cartridge size may have limited how many stages were on the final product. After these pros and cons, time for the final verdict today. The Mayan Adventure gets 7 recliners out of 10. The game is fun, I love playing it, I know it well, but I think I've played it so much I'll never have the wonder of going through it blind again, and any game that loses its charm after a handful of playthroughs won't be as fun or instantly memorable as other platformers for the time, and as I can finish this game fairly quickly, even on the hard difficulty, that kind of makes it lose its challenge as well. 
it feels bizarre to think back to then and see that Activision had published some genuinely good games, and they did so for a while. It's more tragic than anything else. The pattern of gaming giants who have survived so long becoming a far greedier influence who can cause franchises to be destroyed by the wrong corporate move. I'll be going into more detail about Pitfall and the further collapse of a series next time on The Recline of Gaming. Thank you to those of you who have stuck around to watch this whole video. This script has been rewritten and worked on over several years. It's a passion project I had to pick up and put down a lot due to bad timing, and I'm glad I've finally worked my way past obstacles such as several broken computers and lots of writing block. We're finally here, and I'm proud that I can finally share it with you all, having edited this entire video myself. If you want more things like this, then please like and subscribe. That's all I can ask for now. Once I've got more of a schedule going, I may include other ways to support me so that I can make more videos like this more frequently in the future. Take care, look after yourselves, stay safe, and see you next time.